The first speaker of this session is uh, Pinake Chaudhary. Okay. Uh, can you hear me at the back? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so uh, firstly, it's great to be back here and great to see a lot of familiar faces. So thanks to the organizers for getting things moving again. Uh, today, I'll be talking about uh, some work that we are doing on cavitation in amorphous solids. And this is work uh, done, oops. Uh, this is work done by Umang uh, Dattani, who's a graduate student at Math Science, and Rishabh Sharma, who is a graduate student at TFR Hyderabad, and my collaborators, Manajit Karmakar. So cavitation in liquids has been studied quite a lot uh, because it's important for naval applications, for example. So cavitation happens when a very fast-moving object uh, goes through, for example, water, and then because of the high velocity of this object, uh, holes start appearing inside the fluid, and that this kind of cavity formation leads to a lot of uh, accidents and so on. So in the context of naval, naval applications, it has been studied uh, very extensively. So in solids also, cavitation has been reported. So for example, when you're loading a metallic glass, people have observed that there are failure uh, that is happening via the formation of such micro cavities. And more recently, there has been a very nice experiment on uh, fracture in glasses where they show that this kind of micro cavities are responsible or the origin of the eventual fracture and uh, fragmentation of the glass. So understanding this cavity formation in amorphous solids is therefore very important. And we have been looking at this question for some time now. Uh, so uh, this is the typical, so the important, the first important statement is that in order for cavitation to happen, you need cohesive glass formers. Why? Because the uh, phase diagram of the cohesive glass former or any attractive liquid is, has this form. So you have a gas a liquid at high densities, and then you have this phase coexistence region in between. And uh, so what happens is that if you take a high density liquid, you quench it, you form a glass, and then you start expanding it. And then eventually this uh, material will find its way into the gas plus ga uh, this gas plus glass coexistence, coexistence region, and that will lead to the formation of cavities. So in this work, what we are doing is we are doing a athermal study, the first part of the work. So there we are quenching it down to t equal to zero. Basically, we are generating the what are called inherent structures or minima in the local uh, poten in the potential energy landscape, and then we start expanding this glass uh, via some exp isotropic expansion. And so this is a completely mechanistic process, and we are asking how this uh, instability kicks in and so on. So basically, in this process, what is called athermal quasi-static expansion, we are probing transformations within the potential energy landscape. Uh, so what happens is that if you start off with a high-density glass, it has a positive pressure. And then, then as you expand, the pressure falls. And then eventually, it goes negative. And it becomes large, ne largely negative. And then suddenly, this pressure is released. And then the cavity is formed. So and this, the location of this point of cavitation depends upon the system size. The, uh, the sharpness of the jump also depends on the system size. So basically, there is some critical effect that is going on over here. So this is a movie. Uh, oops. Is it playing? Yeah. So you will see that uh, suddenly the cavitation would happen. So there are a lot of movies in the talk. So enjoy the talk. So uh, yeah, so it's, it's almost like a tear of the paper. So you're, pull, uh, you're doing an isotropic expansion. And then suddenly, this uh, tear forms. And then the, the uh, event, as you expand further and further, the, it completely fragments and so on. So we have done quite extensive characterization. I'll not go into the details. So what I'll tell you is basically that since we are surfing on the potential energy landscape, you can study the properties of the Hessian, for example, look at the lowest non-zero eigenvalue. And this goes to zero several times. These are all uh, plastic events that are happening. And at these plastic events, one sees this kind of uh, square root uh, singularities, which are well known in other mechanical uh, deformation contexts. And what is interesting is that since you have this kind of square root singularities, you have the, uh, the eigenmodes that you compute from this corresponding to this uh, lowest non-zero eigenvalue. This eigenmode actually predicts very well the displacement that is actually happening as you are going towards the singularity. However, uh, if you are if when the pressure jump happens, so for example, this pressure jump is happening, the, this the, uh, eigenmode will not predict this pressure jump or the, uh, or the displacement field that emerges out of this pressure jump because it's essentially a cascade of events. So this is the event that is leading towards the singularity, and this is the event that happens at the pressure jump, which is a cascade of uh, such plastic events that are happening and so on. 
Okay, so basically, as you do this uh, isotropic expansion, the system fails via the formation of the cavity at some density. So what we do now is what we call secondary deformation. So we are asking if we do a secondary deformation on the solid as the solid is being expanded, uh, what happens to this cavitation process? Uh, so what are we doing? So we start off this glass, we are expanding it, and then we are sampling states from this and doing various kinds of deformation. One deformation that we're doing is cyclic shear. So basically do an oscillatory shear over here. And the other deformation that we're doing is active dynamics, which essentially taking few particles within the sample, and these have finite activity and they move around and so on. Okay, so in general, the idea is that the real deformations in systems are combinations of various modes. And so it will not be a true expansion always if you have mixing with other modes, and we're exploring how these other modes can uh, lead to the failure process and so on. So this is the phase diagram that we have. So what uh, the statement is that the secondary drive leads to earlier cavitation. So basically, what happens is that if you are, so for example, this is the point at which a pure expansion process would cavitate, but as you add the secondary deformation, then you see that depending upon the magnitude of the secondary deformation, which is, let's say, the uh, magnitude of the oscillatory shear, the magnitude of the active, uh, active dynamics, so the cavitation will happen. This green region corresponds to this cavitation and so on. But the important statement here is that also that you need internal tension or pressure needs to be negative for this uh, cavitation process to happen. In the pressure positive zone, this, uh, even with mixing of this uh, various modes, cavitation is not possible. So what we essentially see is that new pathways become accessible for the stress relaxation, and cavitation couples easier to the shear modes at these densities because it is resistant to the expansion mode, but it, uh, in the, for the shear modes, it leads to uh, cavitation and so on. Okay, more movies. So uh, this is for the cyclic shear. Uh, does it play? Oh, yeah. So this is images from the stroboscopic, uh, basically taking at the zero strain case for the cyclic shear, and you see that this uh, cavity opens up, and this is the, during the cycle. So what you will see is that a lot of cavities open up and close, so there's some healing process that goes on, but there's one cavity that opens up and then it starts growing. And uh, uh, yeah, I'll come to the next part. Uh, yeah, so this, this is essentially the same movie corresponding to the movie on the left. So this is from the active dynamics. So active dynamics is, you can think of it like a local shear that is happening. So here also you see that because of this uh, secondary deformation, these cavities are opening up and so on. So, uh, so then what you can ask is, uh, so what is known in cyclic shear, for example, that if, you, if the amplitude of the oscillation increases, uh, then you will have an yielding that the system will be, have large scale plasticity. So what we see is that even in the, in the case of when we are thinking cavitation, there are cases where uh, these are energy cycles as a function of the strain and so on. As, so this is the first cycle and this is the last cycle. So you reach a state where you have this sort of limit cycle. So essentially the system is going into some absorbed state. As you increase the uh, shear amplitude, this goes into large scale plasticity. So there is also yielding happening as we increase the uh, uh, strain amplitude, but there are also cavitated states which are absorbed states. So you are finding this, yeah, you are finding new uh, local minima in the landscape which has this uh, spatial homogeneities and so on. So these are some spatial pictures. So again, these are, so these are along a single trajectory. You are doing this cavitation at different uh, densities. And you can see it's not the same spot that is always failing. There are different spots that fail. So basically there are diverse local minima that are, have these kind of structures. And these are the corresponding displacement fields. So for example, in the active uh, mode dynamics where it is, uh, the system is glassy, you have very localized deformations. And where the system is yielding for the uh, cyclic shear, you have very expanded shear band-like structures that are forming. Okay, so to conclude, so under expansion, cohesive amorphous solids show yielding transformation by cavitation. And then we add the secondary deformation, which leads to earlier cavitation because they're easy, easy coupling with the shear modes. And uh, yeah, the strength of the secondary deformation would lead to either arrested states or fluidized states. Thank you. Single cavity or? I think for the system size that we have, we have single cavities, but uh, do you expect to, do you I, yeah, if you have large systems, you expect uh, more than one cavity to emerge. Do you expect that they can uh, also merge on? In, uh, so in the, if you're doing an expansion process, then this merger we have seen, but uh, typically you need the thermal, I mean, thermal processes to help in the merger. But suppose if cavities are close by, even in the thermal condition, if you're doing the expansion, then mergers do happen. 
uh, in the cyclic CRP, case, what determines whether a cavity will grow or not? Is it nucleation-like phenomena or something else? Oops, what did I do? <laughs> okay, no, it's, it's okay. Um, I, I would expect that this is a nucleation kind of phenomena. Uh, yeah, but it's not clear to me. I mean, this would like to understand that why in some cases you are reaching these absorbed states and in some cases you are going to large scale clusters. Yeah, this is unclear at the moment. Yeah. Uh, so, so when you had this tear, no, like when you, mm -hmm. expand, so that is when you, how do you expand? You expand from the boundary or you? No, no, this is the isotropic expansion that is happening. So every particle you give some. It's a fine motion in X, Y direction. So, so, so what is the protocol? You just you give some force. It's no, no, it's not force, it's strain basically. Strain, okay. Yeah, so X is the same strain Y, so it's completely isotropic and then, yeah, so the... Then which breaks the... So that I think is just uh, by chance you had this, uh, one of the axes being selected, it could be any other axis for any other, uh, uh, any other initial condition. But if you do it from the boundary, do you expect... Yeah, then you ex expect, so if you're pulling it like this, of course it will break at the middle like this, yes. So some, yeah, sorry. So some fraction of the particles have a active self propulsion. I mean, say the self propulsion. Some small fraction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned something uh, close beyond yielding. You don't uh, reach this absorbing mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. So do you see a difference, like if you are close to the yield point versus like above yielding? Like, is there a qu uh, quantitative difference between like the uh, distribution of cavity size or something? Uh, that we haven't done yet. Uh, we will do, I mean, so this is quite sort of recent work. Okay. So yeah, I think there are a lot of things to still do. We will do it, yes. Okay. So uh, you started from a glass, but instead if you started from a solid, similar things will happen. Yes, right? I expect so, yeah. So I mean, uh, but there would be slip lines and so on that's happening. I mean, here you can have more uh, complex structures, I would believe. Okay. Because of the disorder in the system and so yeah. on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So otherwise it will be sort of similar to crack formation. Yeah, yeah, similar to crack formations. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>